Welcome to the midpoint of our summer speaker series. And this morning, it's a great pleasure to welcome back Dr. Margaret Guren Kibben. Uh, she worships here with her family, Tim, uh, daughter Lindsay. On January 3rd, 2021, Margaret was elected by the House and sworn in as the 62nd chaplain to the United States House of Representatives. Margaret is an ordained Presbyterian minister in the PCUSA, and she served for over 30 years as a chaplain in the U.S. Navy. Uh, she completed her career as the, um, the chief of Navy chaplains. Prior to that, she was the chaplain to the U.S. Marine Corps. Margaret is a Pennsylvanian, graduated from Goucher College in Towson, Maryland, and did her uh, divinity work at Princeton, both uh, the Master of Divinity and the Doctor of Ministry degree. She also has degrees from the uh, Naval War College and was a senior fellow in the National Institute of Peace. Since 1789, each legislative day, both in the House and the Senate, convene with prayer. But given the divided religious and political opinions that have existed since the founding of the uh, country, it may seem incongru incongruous, even perhaps unconstitutional, to have a public display of faith that would be given such prominence in the halls of Congress. They don't start if Margaret doesn't pray. <laughs> <laughs> or, or someone, yes. Um, there's a history that surrounds this, and uh, it, it's a fascinating topic. And that's what Margaret's going to share with us today. So um, prayer in the house, the history of legislative prayer. Please join me in welcoming Margaret Kibben. Well, a very good morning to all of you. It's good to be among friends. As Quinn said, we have been worshiping here in this church for several years. Uh, you may or may not see us, depending on how frequently we can make our way up the, the parkway, uh, whether by virtue of travel for work or the races that are taking place or what bridge is closed. Uh, we are here far less frequently than I would like, but when we do come, it is always a very warm welcome. So thank you for very much for uh, allowing us to worship with you. It truly is a pleasure. And also, as, as Quinn said, since the very beginning of the Republic, Congress has retained and paid permanent clergy to offer prayers to God on the government's behalf. Every legislative day. And I love sharing that because one of the things I've discovered about my job is people love to come visit me. Sometimes they come to pray for me. Sometimes they come to pray on me. Um, <laughs> but in both cases, many are surprised to learn that in fact, both the House and the Senate open every day in prayer. It precedes even the Pledge of Allegiance. If that doesn't kind of give your heart a stir I don't know what does. Uh, and the fact that we are able to continue this is in some cases nothing short of a miracle, but in other cases so incredibly indicative of our need as a people to stay connected, to reach out to the divine. So the first Continental Congress in 1774, uh, in September, on the second day, there was a fellow by the name of Thomas Cushing, who was a delegate from Massachusetts, and he requested that a local Anglican minister open the, the uh, Congress the next day. Now, John Jay and John Rutledge both objected on the grounds that the assembled delegates represented so many religious denominations, probably about five at that point, uh, <laughs> that it would be impossible for all to join together in worship. In fact, a religious service might actually exacerbate their differences. <laughs> this is the part I just love, because when people start talking about how acrimonious the Congress is, how we just can't seem to get along, how there is no room for whether it is decent debate or even prayer, I can tell you most assuredly, this is the foundation on which our country was built. Sam Adams said, I'm no bigot and I can pray with anyone who loves his God and loves his country. The divided religious sentiments have existed for quite some time. Now, there was a fellow who had a church. We we're in Philadelphia right now in 1774. There was, a, there was an Anglican church nearby and the Anglican priest by the name of Jacob Duchesne. 
He actually had two congregations there in Philadelphia. He was rather well known. Uh, he was a great orator and, and well respected in the city. And he was asked then on September 7th in 1774 to in fact open that Continental Congress with prayer. Now he used several form prayers from the Book of Common Prayer from the Anglican Church. He also used Psalm 35, and then he offered a very extemporaneous prayer, all of which, and most particularly the extemporaneous prayer, related to the events of the day. As you can imagine, there was a great deal of upheaval, you know, the idea of what the Brit British were doing to the Americans, how our country was trying to be formed, and yet we were being taxed uh, beyond uh, reason. And the Continental Congress had just been notified of a British attack on Boston. So if you go back and read Psalm 35, and I encourage you to do that, you will see that it itself was particularly apropos. Though he was Anglican, and we as Presbyterian can say it may have been providential. Uh, the line that most pops out at you is that we ask for divine refuge from onslaught of foreign powers. Psalm 35. Well, in letters to their wives, some of the delegates, one by the name of John Adams, who was a rather prolific writer to Abigail, uh, he wrote, it was as if, if heaven had ordained that psalm. And Silas Dean from Connecticut said, the readings were accidentally extremely applicable. Needless to say, then prayer began from 1774. At least informally, Jacob Duche served as the chaplain. Now, there is some question as to why Jacob Duche specifically, and as I said, he was a well-known priest in uh, Philadelphia, a well-known orator. He had, uh, if you read the Jacob Duche story, there are so many connections to the city and to the growing, the, the uh, nascent government that it's probably no surprise that Jacob Duche as a person, as a pastor, would be the one that they went to. However, in that time frame, as you can imagine, uh, they were looking to find, they, the delegates, the, the founders of our country, were looking for ways to find support, to shore up support among Anglican clergy and Anglicans, remembering that Anglicans are coming from where? England, England right? Very good. And, and looking for ways to shore up support to support the cause for liberty. The Continental Congress, admittedly, needed help ingratiating the revolutionary movement with Anglicans, uh, a subversive sort of uh, support against the, the Brits. It leaves room to wonder if the motivation for those prayers wasn't just religious, but can you imagine, partisan. <laughs> John Adams, again, writing to Abigail, said, we were never more guilty of a master stroke of policy. Sam Adams, again, who was a Congregationalist, by the way, said, many of our warmest friends are members of the Church of England, and we thought it prudent to select Duché. Ah, and so it is that what may be on the surface may be only part of the story. Hold that thought. On July 4th, 1776, Duché, as I said, the informal chaplain now for almost two years, uh, for the Continental Congress, resolved on July 4th, 1776, that no longer would prayers for King George III be included in the daily worship. <laughs> he removed the king's name from the Book of Common Prayer. Now, that isn't just a stroke of a pen. And being Presbyterians, we say, yes, okay, you could probably get away with that. Ah, but remember, he is the Church of England, it is essentially a government body, and what he has done essentially is illegal in English law. In fact, treasonous. Now, Duché has a mark on his head. It was later in 1777 when Jacob Duché then was taken prisoner. And apparently, under some duress, he penned a letter to George Washington urging him to surrender to the British. John Adams declared that Duché was an apostate and a traitor. So much for religion. 
So that's the beginning of prayer in the house, a dubious beginning to be sure. So the Continental Constitution, Constitutional Convention, I mean, from May to September 1789, now several years later, just before the convention in 1789, two years prior in June, as they were preparing for the convention, Benjamin Franklin identified that there was very little progress taking place. Surprise, surprise. That perhaps prayer is our common bond. And so you may be familiar with Ben Franklin's famous speech. You may not have connected it to 1787, but you've heard phrases of this. God governs in the affairs of men. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven's blessings on our deliberations be held in the assembly every morning before we proceed to business. And all God's people said, except not those people. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin's uh, suggestion failed to win the day, at least at that point in 1787, for two reasons. One, he was a little late in the game. In 1787, they had had several meetings prior to that, and nobody had felt the need to call on God at that point. So why have we, you know, why, why wait? Why, why uh, we've, we've waited too long, it doesn't matter anymore. But what it did reflect is that there was a standstill even in the Constitutional Convention, that they couldn't agree on anything. Okay, I'm reminded of a wonderful phrase I learned in French many years ago, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. But the other thing is they had no funding. Ah, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. But in 1789, two years later, the very first Congress, one of the very first acts that was approved was that be it resolved that the house and senate would appoint their own chaplains so in 1789 uh april of 25th 1789 samuel Provost, who was an episcopalian was identified as the chaplain for the senate and a presbyterian by the name of william lynn was identified as the first chaplain for the for the house on the 1st of May in 1789. They were intentionally different denominations, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, and what they would do is they would swap between the two bodies. One day Samuel Provost would pray for the House, the next day for the Senate, and vice versa for William Lynn. They also held worship services every Sunday, and they, in, the, in what we call now Statuary Hall, they would hold worship services there, and they too, again, would, would um, alternate the weeks that they, that they served. Now, in September uh, 22nd, uh, 1789, now about four or five months later, then they decided to pay them. <laughs> their, sal their salaries were voted on, and um, they were voted on for $500 a year, which works out to about $17,000 a year for us. Article 1, Section 2, newly ratified, uh, identified the chaplains. Now, um, this is the part where things get a little interesting. We have officially now, as a country, identified religious leaders in the House and the Senate. We have said that we will appeal to the divine. We have made an overt religious gesture in a very secular environment. And one would say, given the divided religious sentiments in the House and the Senate and Congress in general, that perhaps, how in this world did this possibly get passed, especially James Madison? Now, he was not at all pleased. And as you can tell by the author of the Bill of Rights, he then later clearly wrote of his opposition. He did not want to establish a national religion established being the operative word there. He wanted to ensure that there were equal rights for people of faith and people of no faith. In fact, when they decided to vote on whether or not there should be a chaplain, Thomas Paine received three votes himself, although he was a critic of contemporary organized religion. It was sort of a presumably a protest of chaplains. But the vote for the chaplain's payment came just days before the vote for the Bill of Rights with that establishment clause in there. So presumably, 
even the dissenters voted for the chaplains, and that is how chaplains have stayed uh, identified in the House and Senate from that point forward. Very interesting start. You know, even then, we were not quite sure of where religion fit into, where faith fits into our, our, um, our lives. So, but from that point, to think that the chaplaincy was good to go for the, for the next 200 years, uh, that is obviously not true. Now, I will throw a bunch of dates at you, and I apologize immensely. There will not be a quiz. Um, <laughs> But I would like you to hear some of the themes that are going to come through here. So as we get to the point of the Q&A, uh, I'm happy to provide all sorts of facts and figures here, and I will insert some thoughts to that. But I would like to hope that this conversation will not just be uh, a history lesson, that it will be a conversation in terms of what does that mean for the chaplaincy now, what does it mean for faith, and how does faith play out on the Hill. So please do not be... Uh, dismayed if all you're hearing are dates from this point forward. I am more than welcome, uh, open to having questions uh, later that are a little bit more um, substantial with respect to the role of faith and the constitutionality of chaplaincy or even the role faith plays in our current day Congress. But, so that was 1789, so now we're going to go th about 40 years later, and the, there was a, the Senate appointed a Catholic chaplain. This is where everybody goes, oh! <laughs> you may not realize, but in 1832, uh, anti-Catholicism was rampant. Could a chaplain, a Catholic chaplain, stand in front of the body of representatives, senators from across the United States? Would that Catholic chaplain be loyal to the United States? or to the Pope? Can a chaplain, in fact, a Catholic chaplain, have an affinity for, a connection to, can a Catholic chaplain really speak to the needs of the American people if, in fact, they have an equal loyalty to the Pope? Now, the first chaplain who was appointed made a, a wonderful speech that, that outlined, in fact, that he, was, he understood that some belonged to Caesar and some to God, and he re recognized that his role as chaplain was a divine appointed position, and that though his ordination, if you will, his bona fides came from, the, from Rome, his loyalty was to America. But because of that actual movement, what happened was Congress began to receive petitions to end the chaplaincies. I mean, hundreds and hundreds, a flood of petitions to end the chaplaincies, fearing that there would be Catholic influence on the government. It was such a hue and cry that that chaplain was asked to leave after about a year of his tenure. That's 17, I mean 1832. It was not until March of 2000 that another Catholic chaplain was appointed. Dan Coughlin to the House of Representatives. So 1832, now we're moving into 1850. The role and existence of chaplaincies came under serious dispute. Another flood of petitions from across the United States, from across the United States. There was not a state that did not have some sort of complaint or comment to the existence of chaplaincies. And there were many who had been opposed from the very beginning. The Baptists did not see any role for chaplains in Congress. There was, of course, as I said already, the rise of Catholicism. And so that's all the external stuff. Well, then shame on the chaplains because the job itself had become competitive. And the congressman Sorry. said, hello, the congressman said how untoward it is that men would vie for this position. Ah, yes, even clergy are competitive. But then we start thinking about this time of 1850 where slavery was the topic, the issue of the day. And cha chaplains became caught in the crossfire. There were many who were for, there were many who were against. In 1863, William Henry Channing was selected by the Republic, Republican Party for his anti-slavery views. He won up against and another chaplain candidate, a ch candidate who was pro-slavery. 
even the very idea of where chaplains stood on particular political issues played a part on the impact and the role of the chaplain. So they started to re-examine the chaplaincies, both the House and Senate Judiciary Committees re-examined whether in fact we really did need a chaplaincy. Chaplains were supposed to be non-denominational and non-coercive. That isn't to say they don't have an ordination. It is supposed to be their outlook is non-denominational and non-coercive, so therefore it must be constitutional. That's what the committee determined. But in 1855, both the House and the Senate suspended regular chaplains. And it became sort of a rotational thing. They looked for local pastors, ministers in the area. Quinn gets called up. He says, you're opening the house in prayer. And oh, by the way, we're not giving you any money. <laughs> so lots of pastors in the area were, uh, uh, gave, were given the opportunity to open the house in prayer in that time frame. And uh, it was good for the House and the Senate because there was no financial obligation, because that's where it comes down to, nor was there any denominational uh, connection. Well, they realized that wasn't working, and it was reestablished after two months. Well, when they reestablished it, this is in the House, when they reestablished it, they, they determined that they would look for the least offensive candidate that they could find. <laughs> and so... They identified the, very, the, the Reverend Daniel Waldo, a 93-year-old Revolutionary War veteran, <laughs> determining that he was harmless. Gives all new meaning to where's Waldo. In 1857, the Senate took up the issue again. Again, they also uh, went to local ministers but what they determined a couple years later that guest chaplains were just too distant to be helpful. They, didn't, they needed a chaplain of the body who was acquainted with what was going on in their working, their daily work. And this, by the way, is the crux of chaplaincy. This is what differentiates chaplains from pastors, rabbis, imams, priests is that as chaplains, you are a part of the institution and you learn the language and you know the, the battle rhythm, if you will, for those of you who are military, you understand kind of the ebb and flow and, and what makes people work, the warp and woof of that particular institution. And they determined in 1859 that that was crucial to ministry on the Hill. So from 1859, there has been a chaplain in both the House and the Senate. Interestingly, I am the, while I am the 62nd chaplain of the house, I'm only the eighth since the Civil War. So it was not a, it's not been a, the revolving door. It was at the very beginning. Now we haven't seen a lot of issues since then. There hasn't been a lot of uh, contention with chaplaincies on the house or in the Senate until over a hundred years later. And there was, a, there was a, a case brought forward to the Supreme Court, court called Marsh, Marsh versus Chambers. And it actually was questioning not just chaplaincy in the House and Senate, but what role do military chaplains have? Do we have a, is there a role, should we be hiring, paying military chaplains to serve in the military, in government service? Well, it came down, obviously, in favor of both military chaplaincy and the uh, uh, congressional chaplaincy. And for those of you who want to do the research, it's really a fascinating story. But here's where it came down to where the argument lay, how they were able to determine that, in fact, chaplaincy is constitutional. As I told you, within days before approving the Bill of Rights, the vote came to whether there would be a chaplain in the House and Senate, and it was approved. And the framers of the Establishment Clause, i.e. James Madison and company, must not have perceived the chaplains as violating that clause. And the founders did not consider opening prayers as symbolically placing the government's official seal of approval on one official, one religious view. And, here's my favorite, chaplains were simply a tolerable acknowledgement of widely held beliefs held at the time. Chaplains are tolerable. <laughs> so 
Let's talk about then a little bit about what, we, what it means to have a chaplaincy and why religion matters and why this point of opening the house in prayer has had this kind of uh, attraction or distraction from daily doings. Uh, if you think about it, the government's role is not to advance faith. That is really the, the bottom line of the argument. The government should not advance faith. The, it is the job of the religious individual, us as individual believers, and of religious institutions. And as soon as the government gets caught up in putting forth a religious sentiment perspective uh, using religious words, that's when it starts to get itself in trouble. The challenge here is, in today's environment, we have a lot of very vocal religious individuals who are serving in Congress. I remember one of my very first days, I had learned early on, well, I, I tried to sit in Congress d during the debates because I was getting to know the institution. I wanted to be part of the body. I wanted to learn the language. What I learned very quickly is if you sit in the chambers, you can't hear anything Bec <laughs> because the microphones are directed to the speaker and to C-SPAN. So I, th I thought, well, and part of it is I wanted, not only wanted to know the argument, but I wanted to know who the people were. I wanted to know who the actual congressmen were. And they're all facing the speaker, and I'm all behind them. And oh, by the way, remember, I'm there in, in 2021 where everybody's wearing masks, and I really can't tell who they are. So I learned very quickly to go downstairs to my office and turn C-SPAN on. And I could not only hear the argument, but there was this lovely little strip underneath that says, this is representative so-and-so from somewhere. And uh, so I began to understand who these people were. So there I was in my office, and I began to hear script scripture being quoted. <laughs> Hark. <laughs> and, then, and then in the, the, the debate, on the other side of the debate, they threw scripture back. And there's this scriptural debate taking place on the floor in support of a particular, or lack of support for a particular bill. And I went, that is my book. They are using my book. So I ran upstairs and went back to the floor and sat there. And all of a sudden, the religious argument stopped. But I share that. <laughs> but I, I share that because government officials do not and should not have to leave their faith behind but they should share and speak in ways that are consistent with the Constitution. Are you using your faith as a weapon? Or are you using it to assert your particular perspective? How are you using your own faith as it is enabling you to, to vote, to represent your constituency? How is faith being represented? And oh, by the way, are you leaving room for other faith? traditions, other faith perspectives. And oh, by the way, how literate are you in your faith? And here you are up quoting scripture. Well, do you know the context? I'll tell you, I'll tell you one example. It was very early on. And one of the members, I just happened to be paying a call on, on him. And uh, he said, oh, chaplain, I'm so glad you're here. I'm just getting ready to go up on the floor. I'm going to use my time to, to uh, speak to a particular situation, and I'm going to use the passage where they talk about, you know, he who is out without sin cannot throw the first, you know, please throw the first throw stone. And I said, okay. Um, and the subject is, and, and he shared it, and it was in support of a person, of a, of a woman. And I said, okay, now, do you know the story? Uh, because the story is that the woman was caught in adultery. And, and oh, by the way, there was a lot of other things kind of related to her hmm, unsavoriness. So by going up there and supporting her with this scripture, <laughs> do you realize what you're calling her? And he goes, oh, oh, I hadn't thought of that. So... There's a part of me that says, re, re, leave the religious arguments to the clergy. And yet, how do you argue with someone who feels so impassioned about his faith 
And here we are in delightfully in Washington, D.C., more north than south. And for any of you who have spent any time in the south, re religion and scripture is so much a part of the vernacular that they may not realize what, in fact, the scripture says. There's been no exegesis on that passage, but it seems so natural to be part of their general rapport that to divorce it from them is really to take to take the South out of them, to take their faith out of them, to take what they've been raised with and their constituents' literacy away from them. It's a very interesting dilemma in which they find themselves. But the more you think that this is just an American problem, remember that Paul said to the Philippians, there are saints in Caesar's household. And that Plato impressed upon the government's that there should be ethical congruence wherever one, from where, wherever one derives one's ethics. But James Madison said, no civil magistrate is a competent judge of religious truth. Again, leave the arguments to the clergy. Martin Luther King Jr. said that the church is not, um, is, the church is not the matter or the servant of the state, but the church is the conscience of the state. So where do we leave room for the church to speak into the conscience? The Supreme Court said that courts are not the arbiters of scriptural interpretation. John Carr, a Georgetown, uh, from Georgetown, Legislative Affairs to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, said, we, meaning clergy, need to be political, but not partisan. We need to be principled, but not, not ideological. We need to be civil, but not soft. We need to be engaged, but not used. I, I encourage that as we think in terms of not just clergy, but we as, as regular citizens, how are we political, i.e. engaged in the political discourse, engaged in what we understand to be the right answer and how we should govern ourselves. How do we do that without being partisan? Or let me caveat it some, so partisan that we fail to, to contribute to the dialogue. How can we be principled but not ideological? I.e., how do we maintain what is important to us without holding such a strong ideology that we, cannot, we do not leave room for discussion? How do we remain a civil, but not soft, a pushover, if you will? How can we be engaged, but not used? This gives you sort of a sense of the landscape, not only in terms of its foundation, but where we find ourselves even now in 2023. All of those things that I just laid out are all still in play. Even the role of the chaplain or the existence of the chaplain is always, it, some, some more amplified than others, under debate. Do I, I have had people approach me and said, you should be fired. Now, is that me, Margaret Kibben, or is that me that, as a chaplain? What role does the chaplain play? And there are some who would just as soon not have a chaplain. All of the things that I've shared with you from a historic perspective are still in play today. So many have asked me how the job is. <laughs> well, I'll just say it's loaded. And it's, and it's loaded with a lot of things. But, but let me tell you, I enjoy the job. I enjoy it immensely. It is fascinating. I learn something every day, whether I want to or not. And I am not a political person. I've never liked politics. I'll be perfectly frank with you. I do not like politicians. <laughs> At least that's where I stood before I took the job. What I have learned is that I am to love all politicians, and I do. I don't have to like them all. But I have found some that I do. Um, but I, what I have found, too, is, is that how do I help those politicians wrestle with these very things, particularly the things that we said at the end? How do we wrestle with what we hold so strongly our values, our morals, our ethics. How do we hold on to that, particularly if they are 
cloaked in religious verbiage, or more importantly, based in religious beliefs? How do we hold on to those deeply while still leaving room for debate, good debate, good discussion? Somebody once told me, and I need to look this up, and I, I meant to do this before today, but uh, there was a Supreme Court judge who dis discriminated, the di who made the difference between liberty and freedom. Freedom means you can do whatever you want. Liberty means never being sure that you're entirely right. And oh, by the way, it is liberty and justice for all. So I've laid out a whole bunch of things I could chatter on for a while, but I know that you all have several questions and I want to give you opportunity to, to raise some of those. We have a Do you um, pray extemporaneously or do you pray something that you've written out beforehand? Do I pray extemporaneously or do I pray what I've written out? I, I pray, I, I write out all my prayers. And I do that for two reasons. One is they need a copy of it anyway. The poor soul who is taking down the notes really likes to have the notes ahead of time so that they know when I say something like bizarre, like arbiter, they know that I'm not saying arbor, you know, tree, uh, arborer. Uh, but so I do that for that reason. But the other is, is that I take this very seriously, not that extemporaneous prayers do not, but I know for myself as Margaret Kibben, my skill set is I'm better off if I've spent some time working through it. Besides which, I also know myself well enough to know that sometimes the first iteration of the prayer is not the one you should pray. I have, I have a wonderful book I use to write my prayers, and there are several, several that are unspoken, mostly because I had to get it out, because I'm supposed to not be polit I'm supposed to be political, but not partisan. Uh, and so. I'm very careful about how I word my prayers. I will tell you something else about my prayers. I use, for 90% of them, I start with scripture. And interestingly enough, there was a sociologist who did a study a couple of years ago, looked at 20 years of prayers in both the House and the Senate, and she was looking for sort of themes. Were they Thanksgiving prayers? Were they confessional prayers and precatory prayers? Um, were they, how often did they use uh, the name of the divine? Which name of the divine did they use most, fre most frequently? And oh, by the way, did they quote scripture? And I was surprised to discover very few quoted scripture. And I thought, well, that's gonna help. I can do that. <laughs> uh, and what I've done is sometimes I will out and out quote scripture, but most of the time I will use a scripture to speak to me for that day. And it's amazing, providential, how, how God uses a scripture that has come to me for whatever reason to help shape a response for the day. Yes, sir. Um, I had a question regarding uh, the future religion in Congress. Um, sounds like you need to be uh, relevant, bold, and tolerable. Um, but there are changes, <laughs> um, including the growth of the nuns um, that are, have no religion. Yes. And, uh, you know, be interested in your perspective on how religion will be considered uh, going forth decades from now. Thank you. That's a terrific question. I will tell you, Congress is more religious than you think. Um, and we do a demographic study, and there are very few who identify as none, no religion, or uh, atheist uh, humanist. There, there are very, very few. We do have a handful of Muslims. We have a Hindu. We have a, a, a Buddhist. Uh, we have a couple Hindus, I think. Uh, but, so we have a pretty good snapshot of who they are. And I would, I would tell you that they're fairly religious people, uh, not necessarily reflective of the current uh, demographics in the United States. Granted, they are a little older and probably a little bit more, um, I don't want to say the word entrenched, connected with faith as older people uh, than younger people are today. But your point's well taken. And with respect to what role my job is or what role prayer will pay, pray, play, I don't know. But I will tell you with respect to chaplaincy, and, and this is a part I think they're just now coming to understand, and this is something I learned in, as a military chaplain, is that we're there to provide for our own. So for the handful that are Presbyterian who speak our secret squirrel language of Presbyterian, you know, um, we're right together. But I'm there to facilitate for others. So there are several other faith traditions. And oh, by the way, you may not realize this, but there are like 60 
religious organizations on the hill. And that is not just brick and mortar churches or mosques or synagogues or cathedrals even. Uh, we're talking about parachurch organizations, kind of like a Young Life, but for, for congressmen. Uh, and <laughs> not so Young Life. Um, but there are so, a number of different parachurch organizations, several individual Bible studies, prayer groups, and uh, that is alive and well. And so I see my role is to sort of facilitate for people to know, not just congressmen, but the, by the way, every congressman has 17 staff members who work for them. Men, some of them are in their districts, but at least a dozen are working on the Hill. And they're young people. And who takes care of their spiritual needs? Well, presumably I am also their chaplain, but that makes my job rather untenable, uh, one to every 5,700 people. But, um, but what I am there to do is to say, okay, you are this, let me tell you what's available to you here on the Hill. But most importantly, my role is to care for all. And you know as well as I do, their jobs are not easy not just because of the political elements of their job. You have to vote for this, you have to research that, you have to speak to that, you have to deal with your con constituents, you have to do, you know, you play for your party, all those things that come in the package of congressmen. But they're human beings, and they have health issues, and they have family issues, and they have everyday normal stuff going on. Some of them have pay issues, and you may say, what? Well, they may be the only breadwinner in their home and they've left their farm, their working farm, that which their family has been running for decades, they've left that farm to come to DC to represent all the other farmers in their district. And oh, by the way, where do they stay when they're here? So they have to have some place to live and that costs the money. Oh, by the way, they still have children who are going to college. All my point is saying is that the human beings that are in Congress, are wrestling with human stuff. And who is there to help them un take the, the, the valve off the pressure cooker so that that isn't hindering their ability to serve our nation? And that's why I, I take that job very seriously. Now that implies that they trust me. And I will tell you that trust is at a premium on the Hill. That may come as a surprise. Uh, but, but when you stop and think about it, everyone is telling them how to do their job. Their constituents, their party, their caucus, their family, the press, the social media, everyone is telling them how to do their job or how they're not doing their job. And in I walk, and now God's gonna tell me how to do my job too? <laughs> and, and so that take, it's been taking a little bit of time to kind of break into that. And what does that look like? It looks like coffee hour at church. When they're on the floor and they're voting, I am like Quinn and Donna and everybody else on the staff here just checking in on you. How was your week this week? And oh, by the way, how's your mother doing? And you have that surgery coming up next week? How can I be praying for you? And that's how I've been building trust. And it's slow. It's in, in that regard, it's not at all like military chaplaincy because when you're a military chaplain, you're in the command and chaplain, you're chaplain. Doesn't matter whether you're Margaret or Tim or Joe or whomever. Um, but here, they've been feeling me out for about two and a half years and we're making some headway. Okay. Yes, I wanna sir. thank you for your nuanced presentation. I really appreciate that, both in the history and our current situation with faith in the public square. Specifically, we were talking about use of scripture in the debate. Recently, last session, there was a Respect of Marriage Act passed, and it was gay marriage and traditional marriage. And as I read that act, I'm on the other end, uh, I'm seeing an attempt to put the sword aside on both sides in that particular act. Was that your perception of that particular act, if you have any memory of that? And did they debate that and quote scripture back and forth, et cetera? I'm the Law Revision Counsel for the House, oh, so very I good. did okay. all this stuff, yes, and yes. I'm reading the statute yes. as it's written. Sure. What it looked like to me was an attempt to put the sword aside and to recognize two views of marriage and to allow them to coexist. Right. I'm asking whether that was the perception on the floor. I, I think in, with respect to that bill, yes. Uh, I will tell you the most heated bill this week that that caused a great deal of fervor from a religious sentiment perspective was the trans transgender issues. 
uh, very, very challenging uh, from, a, from a faith perspective, and I did get a lot of feedback on that from both sides. One of the questions I have that with, or challenges I have with politicians writ large is that a lot of them profess to have a very strong faith, and yet their actions and their words do not reflect a Jesus orientation. Have you noticed a, that? <laughs> so how do you deal with that? Do you have any comments it's, about that? You know, that's, that's very interesting, and, and I actually was going to say something to that had I kept on chattering, and I, so your point is, is well taken. And what's interesting is that both sides say that of the other side. They say, that we have, by the way, every Thursday morning at 8 o'clock when they're in session, there is a bipartisan prayer breakfast. And it's lovely. It's a lovely moment. It's the most peaceful hour on the hill. And they offer prayers for each other, for themselves, and there's genuine concern at a deep faith-filled level. But several people have come up to me and said, I can't go to that because I heard somebody say, their, give their testimony, which essentially they do, and then they went out on the floor and they voted so contrary to that testimony, I just think they're a hypocrite. Not that the church isn't filled with hypocrites. Uh, but the problem is, is that it's the interpretation, one's individual interpretation of scripture. And so where I think, what I think a Christian should behave is not necessarily how they have interpret, interpreted Christian behavior. However, I will also say that for the most part, the voices you don't hear are trying very hard to be Christ-like or to be faithful to their faith tradition. But it is the 10, 10, and 80 rule. You know, you have the 10% of the crazies on that side, and you have 10% of the crazies on that side. And the 80% in the middle are salt of the earth. That's where the depth is. That's where you're really finding people who are trying to be bipartisan, who are trying to be faithful, who are trying to look for the right answers, who really understand the idea of liberty versus freedom to say and state what I wish. But so I would argue, be very, very careful what you're hearing on either side of the fence, on social media, in media. That is a fraction of what is going on in the House in terms of faithful, careful uh, discussion. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my question is, are your prayers for the day, do you ever take into consideration the topic of the day or the flavor of the day, what's hot that uh, in the news, et cetera, and on the hill? Yes, I do. Those are the prayers I haven't prayed. Uh, <laughs> uh, seriously, though, I, I will tell you, I, I have tried to avoid making any sense that my prayers are political. I've been tr because they have such filters. It doesn't matter what I pray. They're going to hear it through their filter. And I am either for them or I am against them. And what's interesting is that both parties think both ways. Both parties think I'm for them. Other people, others within that same party think I'm against them. And then the same is true for the other. And I prayed one prayer one time and it got a great deal of flack. I won't go into the whole story, but I will tell you, interestingly enough, every time I have used the passages out of Ephesians and Colossians, where I talk about kindness, forgiveness, gentleness, humility, <laughs> and compassion, I've gotten pushback because somewhere along the line on the grand political scale, there are trigger words. Those five are trigger words to somebody somewhere. How dare you say we should? And it is fascinating listening for the trigger words. And the reason I don't put a political thing in there other than I don't want to be political is that I want people to realize that I'm really supposed to be praying on their behalf. That's the whole reason why the chaplain is there. Is, and it was the first statement out of my, my speech is that since the beginning of the Republic, Congress has retained and paid permanent clergy to offer prayers to God on the government's behalf. And so I want to make sure that I'm being faithful to the entire body and not to a position. Now, my cohort on the other side, I don't know how he's done it. He's been in the Senate for 20 years, and I have, I have no doubt where he stands politically. And he gets away with it, but he also has the voice of God, so maybe that's <laughs> part of it. Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, thanks for this fascinating insight into what goes on behind the scenes in the House. Um, I was thinking as you were discussing or talking about what you do during the day that there's a lot on your plate. And 
are there are there other chaplains you can sort of work with, or how how do you take care of your of yourself uh, in this kind of stressful job that you have? Thank you so very much. Uh, I am the only chaplain on the House, and Barry Black's the only chaplain on the Senate. So there are no other chaplains that I um, cavort with uh, or uh, or talk to. However, that being said, that's one of the reasons why having a church like National is so important to me. Uh, to be able to be fed myself, I, I can tell you that many a sermon has ended up in a prayer, um, and and that has been helpful to me. But I will tell you that the job itself is not as stressful as you might think to me, because I I do feel very strongly that God has placed me there, and that has given me a, a, a this, I don't mean it this way, but a supernatural strength, a supernatural, a, a deeper understanding of why I'm here, and so I don't feel so banged about in the wind, the political winds, if you will. And uh, the concerns I hear are, you know, I shouldn't say basic pastoral concerns, but they're not new to me. And so having that background, having served in the military for over 30 years, has given me quite a bit of grounding, if you will, with respect to the basic pastoral needs of people. And so there's not a stressful element to that. But I do appreciate the concern. And, you know, I do a lot of reading. I have great friends on the staff and, you know, I'll have a cup of coffee with, you know, a handful of friends along the way. And that just kind of pulls me out of whatever fray I may be in for the moment. Yes, I sir. want to pick up on uh, your comment about your colleague in the Senate. There's a full page in the Post today that I'm afraid may be setting him up for some, some backlash. Okay. Because it, it, it gives examples of when uh, many people would say he's crossing the line. I mean, during the during the uh, budget freeze, yes. he said, you know, that enough is enough in a yes. prayer. Uh, during the discussion on uh, uh, after a number of, of um, big shootings in the country, he said prayers and, and uh, uh, thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers are not enough. Right. But I, he's he, as you said, he may get away with more than. <laughs> than you do. Uh, I, I just want to use this occasion to say you should ask us and we should respond affirmatively to pray for both of you. Thank you. Because I think you're in very difficult positions and we've had, we've had very black speak here. I think he's loved in this congregation mm -hmm. and he's got a tough job. He does. So I just wanted to make that comment. I, I do appreciate that. And I did hear about the, the Washington Post article who just celebrated his 20th anniversary as chaplain of the Senate. Oh, by the way, formerly a Navy chaplain, having been in the same job I was in as chief of chaplains 20 years prior. Uh, but he is a, I don't know how he does it. And, and, but he only has 100 people to deal with, and I have 435. <laughs> and they're not fighting for their jobs every two years, um, as mine are. I, I don't know, my, my side seems a little more irascible. Uh, and, uh, and I'm not sure what that's about, I, but I have, you know, I've been picked at, and you know, if you know, the, the House vote for the leadership earlier this year in January, I got a lot of prime time, not keen on that, uh, but, but again, people were accusing me of saying something uh, very direct, which interesting, it's not always, that's not, it's, I don't think it's clearly what I'm saying, whereas Barry Black, I mean, he's just, it's just out there with him. God bless him. I, he's pretty awesome. Um, thank you for your words of wisdom today. I really enjoyed it. I am probably one of the few people that enjoy reading a good guest book when I visit places or my own. I love to see what people have learned or new things that they've tried or something they've discovered about themselves. Do you, do you receive a pass down in your role as chaplain or do you come in cold? And if you did receive a pass down, uh, would you mind sharing maybe what one of their words of wisdom would oh. be or what yours would be if, for someone following in your footsteps? I'll, I'll vote for the second question, what I would pass down to someone else, because my predecessor left me nothing. Um, and and I, will, I will say frankly, and I would say this to him too, I, he, he didn't get it. And he left very sad um, because he felt that, well, I'll, I, I just, he left very sad and I thought partly because he was ineffective. And he'd been there for nine and a half years. Uh, and so he was very mad that I even was showing up. He, he said he didn't know he was being asked to leave, but he'd been asked for about two years. Um, for me, what I, it's interesting you should ask that because I'm often, often asked, how did I get the job? And there was a bipartisan, and God only knows, honestly, but um, there was a bipartisan committee 
that helped to, to identify me as the candidate. And there were five other people being, four other people being considered. And I, I share that to say that um, many people, however, assume that Nancy Pelosi appointed me. She happened to be the speaker who put together the task force, but when my name came forward to her, she then had me interview with the minority leader, by the way, the speaker now, and the majority leader. So the three of them determined that I was the pick for chaplain. But recognizing that, and, and I think in relatively good Presbyterian, or at least old school Presbyterian form, when I, it looked like um, Speaker McCarthy was, was to be the speaker, I went to him and to, and to his advisors and said, if you're not happy with me, and you'd like to find another chaplain, I would like to be on that committee to help you find the right person. Because I think it's important to understand how different chaplaincy is in this environment, how different pastoral care is in this environment. And my pass down would be, you've got to love people. And you've got to be willing to have a conversation with somebody with whom you are diametrically opposed and not feel the need to get ill and, and just to love on them for who they are and, and to take them where they are and, oh, by the way, bite your tongue. And I have permanent scars <laughs> um, <laughs> because it ain't about you. It's about them. And then the other question I often get asked is, will you write a book? And absolutely, positively not because it is not my story. It is theirs. And the only reason why I have a story is because they've shared me their story. And I hold those confidences so carefully that I don't want ever anybody to think I'm making money on their story. I'm making money on their suffering or challenges or who they are. So those are the things that I would offer to my successor, whenever that may be. Uh, it's a two-year appointment that I get voted in back every two years, and I'll stay as long as I like it and they like me, and God tells me one way or the other. So thank you very much. We need to pray for Margaret, and I'm gonna do that right now, and I'm gonna encourage you to do that on a regular basis. Please. Lord God, thank you for your servant, Mar Margaret, for her faithfulness to you, for the sense of call that you have given her and that she has listened and heard. Uh, strengthen her, get, grant her great wisdom, but most of all, grant her compassion and love for uh, all of those that you will bring across her path and help her to seek out the ones who are uh, in the rocks, who the lost sheep even. Um, and so, Lord, we are grateful for this time that we've had today, and uh, we ask your blessing on Margaret in the weeks and months ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank, you. Thank you all for being here. We'll see many of you in worship.